Hello and welcome to this presentation on facilitating the understanding of RF circuits through time domain simulations and animations. I am Dr. Francesco Fornetti, I am the author of the paper and the director of Explore RF LTD, which is a company that provides technical training in RF and microwave engineering and instrumentation control. This paper was written independently, but AWR kindly sponsored the attendance of the conference. So, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the transition between AC and DC circuits into RF and microwave circuits. Usually, in the way it is taught in most undergraduate courses, uh, this transition is a little bit too abrupt. So, all of a sudden, uh, you get into the realm of RF and microwave and you talk about reflected voltages and currents, complex impedances, power in the frequency domain. However, that doesn't seem to be a gradual transition between AC circuits and RF circuits in a way which shows that RF circuits are basically AC circuits where the frequency is really high and hence uh, they need to be treated in a specific manner. The reason why in RF and microwave uh, a lot of the uh, concepts are looked at in the frequency domain is that um, for high frequency circuits up until recently you could only have instrumentation that worked in the frequency domain. But now uh, there are uh, scopes, high frequency scopes, which are available, which look at things in the time domain up, up to really high frequencies in the order of tens of gigahertz. And hence it is very important to understand what's happening conceptually um, in the time domain at high frequency. So let's talk a little bit about the transition between AC and DC into RF. The first thing to note is that the maximum power transfer theorem not only still applies at RF as it does in AC circuits, but also it is at the very heart of uh, the concepts behind um, high frequency circuits. At the end of the day, we still want to transfer maximum power to the load. And we know that from the maximum power transfer theorem, in order for that to be achieved in AC circuits, we must have the internal impedance of our source uh, equal to the uh, load impedance. So let's take a look at a typical uh, circuit that uh, most students would have encountered through their undergraduate degree. We've got a, uh, an AC generator with a 50 ohm um, internal resistance RS and also connected to a load impedance RL. And you can see that RL and RS here are set to the same value so as to give maximum power transfer. What I've inserted there also is a coaxial line. Now our coaxial line, as we, we all know, is just an, an inner conductor, which is just a wire, and that's surrounded by uh, some insulator, and then again by uh, a, um, an external conductor, uh, which is usually grounded. Now, at AC frequencies, uh, this doesn't make any difference at all to uh, the operation of the circuit. It is just a wire. It, it doesn't really affect what's happening at all. And hence, the values uh, of the parameters for the coaxial cable, the internal diameter DI, the external diameter DO, um, and the electric constant of the insulator make absolutely no difference to the operation of the circuit at all. And maximum power transfer is still achieved. However, as we go up in frequency, we'll see that as the frequency is increased, the power delivered to the load diminishes considerably. This is because uh, the uh, values of the um, parameters of the coaxial cable, in this case, are set to arbitrary values. And hence, when the coaxial cable um, becomes more than just a wire, which is what happens at high frequency, then you can't achieve maximum power transfer any longer. This can be explained to the student by um, showing that the transmission line, in this case the coaxial uh, cable, uh, is actually uh, a network of capacitors and inductors. And these capacitors and inductors uh, are always there, even at AC frequencies, but they're very small in value. So you have a very small value of the inductance and a very small value of the capacitance. This means that at low frequency, the, in, the impedance of the inductors will be um, very low because it's J omega L. 
and also the impedance of the capacitor will be very high because this modulus is 1 over omega c and hence at low frequency uh, the capacitors will behave effectively like open circuits and the inductor like short circuits. However, as you go up in frequency, uh, although the value of the inductance and the capacitance is quite low, when you multiply it by a really high value for the frequency, then the impedances become uh, significant. In particular, the impedance of the inductor will become higher, and hence you can't see it as a short circuit anymore, and also the impedance of the capacitor will become lower which means that you have a sort of connection between your inner and outer conductor albeit through a capacitive um, element. Now to be able to transfer um, the maximum power from the source to the load we can't just have RS equals to RL but they also have to be equal to the characteristic impedance of the line or rather the characteristic impedance of the line also has to match the source and load resistance in order for maximum power transfer to be achieved. The other thing the students tend to find hard when they are studying RF and microwave engineering is that they can't do what they did with uh, DC and AC circuits in the lab. You can't just have a breadboard and uh, a bag of components and start sticking them on and putting some wires between them and using potentiometers to be able to change things and tweak them and tune them and certainly in the process also make a few um, uh, polarized capacitors explode and create a few puffs of smoke. Uh, this is because of course every wire has inductance and, um, and also the potentiometer will have connecting leads with also, which will also have parasitics uh, from its own internal construction you will have some stray capacitances as well so you can't really do this sort of work uh, at high frequency. This is when uh, simulators can come to the rescue. Um, AWR produces a simulator called Microwave Office which is in very useful, it's very fast and also it allows you to use something called a tune tool. You just go around the schematic of your circuit uh, with a little screwdriver um, cursor and you can click on everything that you want to change and tune and play around with and see in real time what happens to the results which are displayed on your graphs. I will just show you a little video now which uh, explains exactly how this can be done. We'll be changing the values of the inner diameter and the outer diameter of the coaxial cable and also the uh, dielectric constant uh, of the insulator between them. And we can see in real uh, time how things change uh, in terms of the power delivered to the load. So first of all, the inner diameter, if we increase it, then we decrease the overall impedance of the line and we improve the power transfer. We can then revert things to the initial values and look at DO, the outer diameter, and see what happens. You can see that as we decrease the outer diameter, then we um, decrease the impedance and get, improve the power transfer, and the opposite happens when we increase it. Then we can take a look at the dielectric constant. The electric constant, when we increase it, um, we actually improve the power transfer by decreasing the impedance. We can now set the values of DI, DO and Epsilon R to those of a typical 50 ohm cable, the RG58. And this will give us an impedance of 50 ohm for the cable, which will ensure the maximum power transfer. Now you can see that there is an equation um, at the bottom right hand corner of the slide which tells you exactly how the characteristic impedance of a coaxial cable changes. Uh, this equation of, of course has got a physical meaning which we don't have time to explain. However, there is a reference uh, in the references of the paper which uh, will direct you to a video uh, on coaxial cables and uh, in that video things are explained very thoroughly from a physical point of view now let's talk a little bit about time domain reflectrometry. Uh, time domain reflectrometry is a very useful tool uh, to uh, help the students understand how transmission line works and what's really going on. I myself hadn't seen a time domain reflectometer in a physical form uh, up until uh, 2010 when I went down to Sydney University and did a bit of teaching there. 
and uh, they had one in the lab. Anyway, it's very simple, really. Um, you just have a um, step generator, which produces your incident signal, produces a step, and sends it down the transmission line to your load. Now, if the line is matched, so at the end of the line you have a load which, is, which has the same impedance as the characteristic impedance of the line, then you have no uh, signal reflected, and the scope uh, will only show the uh, incident voltage that you've sent down the line. However, if there is a mismatch, then there will be some voltage reflected back, and what you see on the scope will be the uh, incident voltage, and then uh, after a time which is equal to the round trip um, time of your voltage pulse down the line and back, you will see that uh, the reflective voltage has been added to the incident one. And uh, we will look at this in a bit more detail in a moment. So even if you don't have a time domain reflectometer in the lab, and personally we don't actually have it either, uh, we can use the simulator and a transient uh, analysis to, to see what actually happens. Now we'll look at open circuit terminations. So we've got a 50 ohm line here which is terminated in an open circuit, so it's left open at the end. So the first thing that we can do is send a pulse down the line and we can make this pulse short enough so that its duration is actually shorter than the round trip down the line. So you send the pulse down the line, it travels all the way to the end of the line and gets reflected back, but by the time it comes back the original pulse that was sent is not being sent anymore because the pulse width is quite narrow. And so you can see two distinct, distinct pulses on the line. Of course the voltage uh, is in phase because it's an open circuit. And you can actually work out, uh, based on the round trip time, uh, the uh, length of the line. Of course you need to know also the velocity of propagation in your transmission line to be able to carry out this calculation accurately. If we increase the pulse width, then we'll have a different scenario. This is more what you see on a time domain reflectometer, where uh, you're actually sending a step rather than a pulse. Now, uh, by the time the signal comes back, your initial incident signal is still being sent, and hence the reflected signal will add algebraically to the one that you sent. And in this case, we can see that we get a doubling in, in the voltage. Rather than having two distinct pulses of the same amplitude, we have a step at some point which doubles the amplitude, and that's because incident and reflected voltages are actually algebraically summing. Other terminations will also have distinct signatures. So you can actually see, for example, what happens when you uh, put a termination in, which is um, lower that in impedance than the transmission line impedance. In this case, we are terminating our line with uh, an impedance which is half the characteristic impedance of the line. What happens in this case is that you get to the end of the line, you find an impedance that's lower than the impedance of the transmission line, and hence there's more current that can flow. Because you want to maintain the same power, if the current increases, you have to have a drop in the voltage. And this is what is shown in the time domain reflectometer display. Equivalently, when you uh, get a termination which is twice the impedance of the characteristic impedance of the line, then what happens is that you get to the end of the line, there is less current that can flow, and then because there is less current going through, the voltage has to rise to maintain similar power, and hence you get a step up in the voltage. Capacitors and inductors also show a very distinct uh, profile on a time domain reflectometer, and of course can be simulated just as well as these other terminations. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about animations. Uh, I think this is one thing that the students really enjoy and they want to see really what's going on uh, down a transmission line in real time and be able to see it at a speed uh, that uh, they can actually observe because changes usually happen at the speed of light and if you show them an animation which slows things down, obviously making them aware that things still happen, travel at the speed of light or, or thereabouts, uh, then they can understand better what, what was really going on. This animation that I've created looks, looks at things in, in two ways. Um, this is the classical way to look at things. You look in, uh, say, you have a frontal view of the transmission line. You're basically looking across its length and uh, uh, you see what happens as time progresses. 
And um, so you're looking at the voltage across the length of the line uh, at specific instants in time. But it's also interesting to actually get yourself at one specific point along the line and then see uh, what actually happens at that point um, uh, as time progresses. So you're just fixing yourself in space and then going around the timeline. Um, this is quite an interesting uh, view. You can see things from two different uh, points of view and uh, to this end it's also interesting to look at the 3D graph that we've got here where you can see what happens uh, both in a kind of temporal and uh, spatial dimension. Now lastly I'd like to show you um, a video that illustrates how this animation works. As you can see you've got various terminations, the matched uh, termination of 50 ohm, you can have a short circuit, an open circuit, but also um, the example that we mentioned earlier, ZL lower than Z0, so half of the uh, characteristic impedance of the line, and also ZL greater than Z0, so twice the characteristic impedance of the line. And we can see what happens uh, in, in, in a couple of interesting cases. Let's start with the, uh, of the short circuit first. You can see that there are uh, quite extreme variations in the resulting voltage along the line and that the nulls remain fixed at specific positions. Now when we draw the 3D graph uh, and then we flatten it to get a sort of a map, we can see that there are little islands uh, where the uh, voltage is minimum and islands where it's maximum and they're very distinct. Now we have a uh, much milder mismatch, we have 25 ohms, so you can see that the variations in amplitude are not quite as extreme. And uh, as we get on to our uh, 3D graph and we flatten it, you'll see that you don't see uh, such distinct little islands of peaks and troughs. The uh, changes between them are a bit more gradual. Finally, we have a 50 ohm termination. You can see in this case the amplitude stays the same, but of course the wave is traveling, so the phase is always changing. And uh, as we get to our 3D graph, you can see that in this case you're basically getting a constant amplitude sinusoid propagating in, in, in the time domain. So, first of all, I'd like to thank AWR Corporation for their support. They've been very supportive with licenses and, of course, with the conference attendance fees um, and have generally been um, very much on board with all the teaching material that I've prepared. Talking of which, there are more tutorials which are available on my YouTube channel, uh, which is called RF Microwave, all in one word. And you can also see some more interesting material on my website, which is called docfrankie.com. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm uh, happy to answer any question. If you have any queries, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much for watching.